There's two buttons to turn everything on. Good evening, everyone. We are continuing our study on the Tri-City Metroplex, which is just my version and my way to, to call this area right here. We're, we are specifically talking about the beautiful and unique Lycos Valley. The Lycos Valley. And that's what I'm calling the Tri-City Metroplex. So just a reminder of the land that we're talking about in the area. Um, Colossae would be like the Broken Arrow Church. Laodicea would be if you left here and went to the State Fair at 21st and Yale. And then from there, if you went to Heropolis, you'd be like going to the Tulsa Zoo. So that kind of gives you the land mass of what we're talking about. We have way a lot more people in this area than like right now, this today, than they did back then. But that's kind of the way it is with a lot of the cities back then. They just didn't have the number of people that we have around now. So Colossae is our building. I do, I do want to remind you that this area was a Roman retirement destination. Uh, and it was that for many reasons. Um, there are retreats for healing and medication here uh, in Colossae, in Heropolis, and in Laodicea. They're all kind of vying for that medical dollar. The, there are wealthy high-end homes. There are gigantic temples. There are some firsts. Uh, they had all that, plus they had some really cool places that you could come and see. So there was scenery, there was, there was all this. And from the Bible, we even understand that there was a connection between these churches right here, even as uh, the book of Colossians was written to the church in Colossae, but it said, be sure and pass that around. Make sure Laodicea reads it. And by the way, you read the letter I sent them. And we're kind of... I'll kind of make an assumption that Heropolis also got to read those letters. Because I can't imagine they're up there on their, the top of their little you know, mammoth cliff uh, hot springs up there going, how come I didn't get to read it? Uh, so from the Bible, we understand that there is that connection. And, I, and let me kind of point out that connection from Scripture. Colossians 2, verse 1. I want you to know what a struggle I'm going through for you. Now that's the church in Colossae. For God's people at Laodicea and for all those followers who have never met me. I do it to encourage them. Then as their hearts are joined together in love, they will be wonderfully blessed with complete understanding and they will truly know Christ. Also in Colossians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 and also 15 and 16. Your own Epaphras, who serves Christ Jesus, sends his greetings. He always prays hard that you may fully know what the Lord wants you to do and that you may do it completely. Verse 13, I have seen how much trouble he's gone through for you and for the followers in Laodicea and Heropolis. It's talking about Epaphras. Verse 15, give my greetings to the, to the followers at Laodicea, especially to Nympha and the church that meets in her home. And this letter has been read to your people. After this letter has been read to your people, be sure to have it read in the church at Laodicea. And you should read the letter that I sent them as well. So, from the book of Colossians, from Scripture, we've received a glimpse of what God wants the Tri-City churches to make sure that they know. Kind of instructions on godly living, how you can grow in the Lord. Uh, and specifically, he's talking to them but we know from Scripture, because we have those things today, that he is also talking to us. And so last week we looked at the city of Heropolis. And so I have the map of Heropolis, and you can see the entrance gates to Heropolis right there. If you put yourself on that road up by the necropolis, necropolis is just their, their way to say graveyard. Okay. So if you put yourself up at the graveyard, start going south, going down the road, you, you hit 11, uh, that's the entrance that we're looking at. So we're coming down the road, we're, we're about to enter the city at the gate of Domitian. And this place, Heropolis, is traditionally the place that the apostles Philip and Bartholomew uh, took the gospel. And it's also traditionally the place that we believe Philip was martyred. Uh, we notice the Domitian Gate on the north end of the city. 
that gave praise to the emperor Domitian, uh, the Roman, you know, the Caesar, and it gave praise to him as Lord and God. That's kind of what you would say when you came in. Uh, but I doubt Philip and Bartholomew said that. But that's kind of one of those things that, as a pagan, that's kind of what you would say and do by entering through that gate. Um, you can also see there's two gigantic towers there. There's three arches, beautiful gateway. Uh, that street from about that point is going to run about a mile and a half. And it's going to go all the way to the south end of town. The, in, in Heropolis, we remember we saw the, the nymph, how do I say it, Nymphaeum, which is basically a big city fountain. So some water was brought in by aqueduct. They filled up this fountain. It's where you could get a nice drink of water. Fresh water ran into this beautiful fountain, and it was attributed not only as the city, you know, sustenance for fountain, you know, for water, but it was also right there at the uh, temple to Apollo. So as you partook of that water at the city fountain, you were also giving homage to Apollo. This is the temple of Apollo right beside it. It's kind of a little bit behind it, but right beside it, there's not a whole lot left. And I did want to point out something um, on this. That's pretty much all that's there, this big, nice staircase going into it. But if you look off all the way to the right side, there's a dark area on the picture, do you see that? It's kind of a, it's actually a door that goes down into a cave. Now, the next thing we're gonna look at is also called the plutonium, which is, again, right beside that. Uh, you know, if you're looking at it, it's just gonna be further to the right. They're all there together. And the plutonium is like the gates of Hades where you can go down into the earth. Well, that's also a gateway that's connected to the temple of Apollo that was also called a gate of Hades that you could go down into, the, into that poisonous cave, uh, very much a poisonous cave. So this is the, the plutonium. Um, that is uh, a statue of Hades that's been put there. That entrance right there, there usually isn't water there. There wasn't water there in Paul's time. That was just a flat out entrance where you could walk through. You could bring a cow in there. You could walk the cow with you into that into that uh, doorway, if you were a priest of Apollo, the cow would die and you wouldn't. And it just amazed everybody. Animals that would fly in there like a bird, they would die very quickly. Uh, and it's mostly because of the poisonous gases that were in there. And um, they've done geological studies. They figured all this stuff out where it comes from. They figured out about how high it, it you know, what the level is. If you go below this, you're going to die. And if you stay your head above that, you can breathe fine. Uh, or if it's you know, up here, then you can hold your breath. But, you know, it was very amazing to the people there. That's the plutonium. Ancient writers called this door the plutonium. Just <clears throat> north of there, so if you go up that way, past the statue, you're going to get to the theater. What a glorious theater that was there. The theater is going to notate the beauty of the carved reliefs, the friezes, the statues. It's all going to going to shout how beautiful and artistic and, and creative uh, the people of this town were. And it was very clear that you're basically saying by attending the shows there that we are not embarrassed. This play, this drama presents to us and to our visitors what we believe in. This is who we are. And that's what you would see there. And they would use the front of that stage as a place to make these little friezes or niches and carve out images that they could switch out that were about whatever play that they were having at the time. But with all that being said, the most, the most impressive attraction at Heropolis is an attraction you can see across the Lycos Valley from Laodicea. So if you're standing on the plateau where Laodicea is and you look across the valley, you can see this, the, the white calcium deposits of the hot springs. I mean, it, it is gorgeous. So let's just pretend like, well, I mean, we're standing at Laodicea and we're looking across the valley. That's, that's how far away it is. And now pretend like you're up on the hill, up on the hill behind uh, Heropolis. So you're up higher and then pretend like you have a, like a, a air balloon, hot air balloon above you and you might see something like that. Okay, that's what the hot springs looks like. And you can see the ruins of Heropolis right there. That's cool. That's impressive. That's even cool and impressive today. 
And um, I think I mentioned last week, showing you on the map, that there was a hotel right there. Well, I looked into that hotel a little bit more, and their swimming pool at the hotel is actually one of the hot springs there. And, you know, I get it. If you go to Disney and you might go to one of their, you know, like pools or something, and they might have like fake ruins in the pool, well, there you're going to have actual real live ruins, you know, ancient ruins in the water that you're swimming around. So that's, that's kind of cool. Everyone in this part of the world, everyone in this part of the world, they knew that if you were tired, if your feet were tired, if they ached from walking around on the gravel all day, if you were sick in some way, you could find some help and feel better just by going and relaxing in the hot uh, springs of Heropolis. Quite the competition for Col uh, Colossae and Laodicea. Um, it is still quite the competition, right? And, I mean, who doesn't want to go get in that like right now? Doesn't that look gorgeous? But our attention is going to turn to Colossae now. Colossae is going to be at the foot of a large mountain. You see where it says Broken Arrow Church of Christ? You see the white behind it? That's a snow-capped mountain, basically snow-capped all year round. Okay, it's that high, it's that, you know, that cold there. Um... So what that means is portions of the year, Colossae is going to have hundreds uh, of little streams of not only spring water, that are, that's cold spring water that's going to come off that mountain, but the melting snow. And so it's going to come straight toward Colossae. Now, if you visited Colossae today, you'll probably be a little bit disappointed because nobody's really done much excavating there. And I, I found that out and. And also at the same time found that hard to believe. I'm like, really? There's a whole book in the New Testament written to the church there. And we've not really dug on the, the hill that's Colossae. There's so much to see, but I'm just going to tell you, see that bump? That's Colossae. You can see the big mountain in the background. You kind of see snow on top of it, but that's Colossae. And I know you're impressed. Uh, not much there to see today. Colossae, uh, it did have an amphitheater. It did have an Acropolis you know, where there were some temples and stuff like that, but we're not all sure what was there. And the theater, you can make it out because you can see that it's a kind of a dimple in the side of the hill. And you can, if you get closer, you can kind of tell that there were seats there, but that's what it looks like. And that road, that nice paved road wasn't there back then, <laughs> okay? Uh, that's what it looks like today. At the end of the first century, uh, and in the time that the church was there when they received the book of Colossians, that was already a, a city in decline. That city was actually built hundreds of years before Heropolis and Laodicea, and it had had its heyday, and kind of people had kind of started already moving away from there and moving to Heropolis or even Laodicea. And Laodicea, it's at the bottom of that mountain, so these streams are coming down. And has anybody ever gone hiking up in Colorado in the summer when you got those streams coming down? Okay, yeah. And one time Kim and I went on what we called a wilderness trek with a bunch of kids from our church. And uh, this is going to sound crazy, but to take a, to, to take a bath, they, they taught you to do what they called was porpoising. And it's where you get in, in a stream like that and you do a push-up in it and get up out of it as fast as you can because it's like freezing, <laughs> okay? We did have one baptism while we were there in one of those crazy cold little ponds, you know, little lakes that were there. That's what's coming down. That's what's coming down to the Lycos River. That's what's helping that place be fertile, but that's coming right down the side where Colossae is. This clear, fresh, freezing cold, drinkable uh, water. Um, in the springtime and in the summertime, all this water has come flooding down, thundering over waterfalls, this cold, this fresh, this invigorating, good-to-drink water. Is anybody getting thirsty right now? So they knew that if you were thirsty or tired or needed some new life, how wonderful it was to go to Colossae and have that cold glass. They didn't have ice, right? They weren't doing the ice thing but they had cold, cold water that would come out of the springs there. How wonderful it was to go to Colossae. So back to the map. These three cities are really, really close by, and I know that might be a little bit hard and busy, but I kind of wanted you to see the terrain. 
I am going to show you that's Ephesus right there. It's about 120 miles all the way to Colossae right there. And you can see this nice valley here. This right here is the Lycos Valley. This right here was a Roman road. So it's going to be one of the main roads that Rome put all that money in to build, you know, where the saying, all roads lead to Rome. This is one of them that was going to get you to Ephesus so you could take a boat to Rome. Um, Heropolis is right there. But there's another road to Rome that comes through right here. It's going to come past Smyrna. It's going to go by Sardis. We've already talked about Sardis, which is right there. It's going to head on around this valley right here by Philadelphia. I just called it by its nickname, but that's the original city of brotherly love. And then it's going to go on through a pass right here and make it down. That's another Roman road. So one of the cool big things about Laodicea is that Roman road is going, to di is going to come by Heropolis, but it's going to go straight to Laodicea. And then from there, it's going to go on to Colossae and then on over that way. Uh, very, very, very interesting. So these three cities, retirement cities of the Roman government, the army, they were vying for the medical dollar. dollar. They were vying for the touristy dollar. They were vying for prestige. Okay? So... Laodicea. Laodicea. Um, Laodicea, out of the three, was the richest, more powerful of the three. And what I want you to know is Laodicea was built not because of the location, meaning there's a bunch of water here, because technically on the top of the mound where they were, there wasn't. Okay? They were built because that's the road. It's almost like when you go down, you know, one of the highways here and you're coming up to a city and somebody built a truck stop like two or three miles before you get into the city. And they built a big, huge, gigantic truck stop because they knew that you were going to get there first, right? And so lots of people stop there. Then when you go on into the city, you're like, rats, I could have had cheaper gas. They put this where they knew everybody was going to be. It's, it's at the culmination of two Roman roads coming from one direction and one going this way. So it was very much placed there, not because of the resources as far as water goes. It was placed there because of the road uh, connection. So evidently Laodicea was quite a sight. And the ruins, if you go there to look at them, they are quite a sight to see. Pretty impressive. So it begs the question, what can we learn about Laodicea from the letter that's written to them in Revelation? Because we don't have Colossians written to them, although we know that they get to read it, and we've talked about that already. But what can we learn from the Revelation? And I'm going to tell you straight up front, one of the things that we learn is we're going to learn that the letter that was written in Revelation is going to really speak to those things that they actually know about. The way I wrote it down here is we immediately discover he was using things that are familiar to those people to teach them. So I want to, I want to make sure you know, here are some of the things that you might not have known that uh, is famous about Laodicea. Laodicea was famous for their exporting of fine textiles made from the local black wool. You know, the black sheep, the, the black wool. Um, they were famous for this because, number one, they could sell this and you didn't have to dye it black. I mean, it was already there. And it was incredibly soft. It was just an amazing, uh, uh, amazing thing. The wool was uh, put into garments that were made for all sorts of kinds of things. It was not just garments. It was carpets and, and lots of things like that. So they exported this, this black wool. This black wool of Laodicea was famous. The other thing that they were famous for was uh, eye salve or, you know, eye balm or whatever you want to call it. The city was famous for the industry of eye salve. Specifically, they were known for making what's called Phrygian eye salve. Phrygian meaning the location of this area uh, in Phrygia. Uh, and that was a specific eye balm that helped cure certain diseases. And here's, here's uh, when I was trying to read about that and discover about it, what I found out was they would make from dry ingredients, they would kind of pulverize a bunch of dry stuff, all the different ingredients that made Phrygia eye salve. They would pulverize it, then they would add some kind of liquid, either water or maybe even a, a, an amount of olive oil, 
to make it you know, palatable and moldable, they would mold it into shapes. They would mold it into bricks a lot of times, or maybe I should say not necessarily bricks, but you know, little cakes. Then they would like roll a stamp around it, and on the, what they would put, and you can kind of see it on the top one there, the, the, the square-shaped one, uh, it's going to tell you what doctor put that together and what it's meant for. Okay, I, I just found that interesting. It's kind of like its own prescription. It came from this, this medical facility, and it's meant for this. Um, usually this stamp was on it. Well, they didn't just make it in brick form. They made it also in what I would just call tablet form. And on the tablet form, or even on the brick form, they would stamp it. Okay, that round stamp right there is taken from one of the tablets that's been found, and I'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but here's something interesting. The round one literally, spo literally says on it, if you can make out all that and understand what all it means, it means this. The colorium, and that's another word for eye lotion or eye wash, the colorium of Lucius Julius Sal Salatoris to be applied with a fine brush for lipetudo, which means soreness or bleariness or basically the inflammation of the eyes. That's pretty interesting. Okay, that's what that stamp means. Now, here's what I do want to tell you. Back in the 70s, they discovered a shipwreck off the coast of Tuscany. And uh, it was found, and the shipwreck was uh, a ship that wrecked somewhere between 140 and 130 B.C., it was discovered in 74, and it contained a lot of stuff in it. Uh, that's some of the stuff that was in it. It contained Syrian glass bowls that were still found in stacks. It contained pottery from Pergamum. It contained wine, uh, amphora from Rhodes, and that's, those are those bottles at the very top. It contained lamps from Ephesus, and as well as a, a vast number of coins, lead vessels, and other consumer goods. But the most intriguing thing that's found, at least what it seemed like to me when I was reading about it, plus it fit my lesson here, was it found a, a large cache of medical equipment. Okay, so see the, see the round uh, kind of tin cans there? There's stuff in there that's medical in nature. Sealed cylinders made from tin, and um, in one of those cylinders... Inside one of the ten cylinders was a rare archaeological treasure. Uh, they found five gray disc-shaped tablets stacked on top of each other like Mentos. And despite having been in there for over 2,100 years, they were dry. Wow. They've been underwater for over 2,000 years, and they were dry, and they, and they stayed uh, I mean, you can see it. That's, that's one of them. Uh, the tin had remained watertight, and the tablets were still intact. In 2010, scientists published the first DNA analysis of the tablets, and they found evidence of a wide variety of plant matter in the tablets, including carrot, radish, parsley, celery, wild onion, cabbage, alfalfa, yarrow, hibiscus. Uh, they also found uh, these plants uh, were known from ancient sources to be used for medical purposes. Now, I say it like that because we kind of know now that some of the stuff they used in ancient times for medical purposes really wasn't real helpful, right? So they analyzed it. They got the DNA of what that stuff was. And they, show, they still weren't sure, what is that? I mean, what are they trying to do with this? Uh, what is this supposed to have cured? So an Italian team of researchers uh, believe they found the answer. And the answer that they have found was that this was the ISAV tablets from Laodicea. Now that's cool, and that's why it fits my lesson. That's why I'm even bringing it up. Archaeologists from the Archaeological Superintendents of Tuscany, chemists from the University of Pisa, and evolutionary biologists from the University of Florence examined the components and of the samples from a broken tablet uh, and they found organic components identified uh, starches that show evidence of having been cooked, uh, animal lipids, vegetable lipids, beeswax, pine resin, 
and 53 kinds of pollen, including, uh, well, 40% of the pollen they found was from uh, olives, uh, from the olive, olive tree. 13% um, was wheat pollen. And then they have also tr trace amounts of vegetable charcoal, which I found that interesting. They also found some fibers. And it looked like that was what was left over of what they wrapped the tablets in. And they found kind of the, the remnants of the fibers, but they also found what it looked like on top of the fibers. Therefore, you have that picture of what we showed earlier that was kind of drawn, but that's, that was the image that was on top of the tablet. Isn't that awesome? Um, let's see. I have down here, I needed to tell you about Pliny the Elder. Pliny the Elder lived between A.D. 23 and A.D. 79. Pliny the Elder was a Roman author. He was a naturalist, a natural philosopher, and as well as a naval and army commander uh, of the Roman Empire. He was a friend of Emperor Vespasian, and he wrote an encyclopedia called Naturalis Historia, which means natural history, uh, which actually became our model for the encyclopedia. Uh, he spent most of his spare time studying and writing and investigating natural and geo uh, geographical uh, phenomena in the field. And so, uh, as I'm telling you about this guy, because he's going to say some things about Laodicea's ISAV in his writings, but just as an uh, interesting side note, he was kind of a hefty man. Uh, Pliny, it says this, this, this is a quote, Pliny, a corporate, uh, no, a corpulent man. And I went, a corpulent man? What is that? So I looked it up and went, oh, fat, okay. Uh, Pliny, a fat man who suffered from a chronic respiratory condition, possibly asthma, he died from asphyxiation caused by toxic gases during an, attempt, during an attempted rescue of some people that were caught in the eruption of Pompeii. So Pompeii erupted, he was close by, he got on a ship, made everybody sail over there to rescue some people. Um, he didn't quite make it down the mountain as quick as everybody else and got caught in a gas, a poisonous gas out, out letting from the volcano. And when they came back three days later when it was safe, uh, they found him, they found his body and with no injuries, he just had died. So Pliny the Elder, along with a Greek physician, uh, Pedanius Discorius, both mention that uh, zinc oxide was used and collected from the walls of furnaces and you, that, was, that were used for copper uh, casting, but they used that zinc for medical purposes. And that's also found in these tablets. Interesting fact, the large round shape of these tablets, about three to four centimeters in diameter, half a centimeter thick, also indicate that they're gonna be used for eye treatment. Uh, and here's an interesting fact, the word Collyrum, that you know I had mentioned uh, that I read a while ago, is actually derived from the Greek word kalura, which means small round loaves. So that's what those things were called. Okay, um, these small round loaves, uh, kalorium, and kalorium is the word for eye salve. So they got the word eye salve from the word small round loaf from those tablets. Does that make sense? I just thought that was kind of cool. All right. So Laodicea is known for having this medical treatment. They're known for having a hospital. They're known for having a school to teach this medicine. And did you know, we're going on to the next thing that Laodicea was famous for, concerning their wealth and their self-sufficiency. Okay, the wealth of the inhabitants of Laodicea was widely known in the ancient world. I mean, widely known. Laodicea minted its own coins and minted a lot of them. And so if you get on, if you get on the auction today, uh, you, if you can read that little bitty writing, you can see what those coins are actually going for as of today, if you wanted to buy one. Okay? Um, so you can get these today. These coins were minted in Laodicea. 
Uh, they might have had Zeus. They might have had Asclepius. They might have had Apollo. Later on, they might have had one of the Roman emperors all on these coins. And this place is going to be famous for its banks. Now, we've already talked about a place that was famous for its being a bank, and that, but that's because it was a, a temple. And who would attack a temple and try to rob a temple? Well, they actually had banks here. They were famous for their banks. Even the famous Roman orator and statesman Cicero used the banks here. Uh, their minted coins and their banking system was based upon the gold reserves that they had on deposit from everybody who brought their gold in. Okay, so they were known for their money, specifically gold, and then making coins as a basis for their, for their banking system. This is the first city that we've ever studied that I've ever found a list of famous people that were born in this city. I mean, including Ephesus. I don't, I don't have that. You know, who are the famous people from Ephesus? I don't know. But I do know that philosophers Anticus and Theotis are from Laodicea, uh, as well as Polemon the first. It's spelled just like Pokemon, but instead of a K, it's an L. So Polemon the first was the king of Pontus, Little Armenia, and the Bosporus. And he was born here. And his dad evidently was pretty famous too. His dad was named Xenon. Uh, he was an outstanding order and aristocrat, arist, aristocrat, aristocrat. Since the city is located in this region, and we know because just across the valley they got these hot springs, this is a, a geological kind of tumultuous region. Can I put it that way? Um, you probably knew this, but maybe not. Uh, it often had earthquakes. And I don't mean the kind we get here in Oklahoma and we're like, did that happen? Did I feel something? But I mean like earthquakes like in you know, Japan or like California, uh, like the ones that just happened in Turkey. I mean, er earthquakes that would shake your building and ruin it. Uh, it was known to have earthquakes. One of the most powerful one, ones happened in 27 BC during the reign of Augustus. But another one happened in 60 AD that leveled the town. I mean, it leveled not just Laodicea, but many of the towns in Asia Minor. Uh, it damaged many of the towns. And at that time, Nero was the emperor of Rome. And Nero came to all the cities there and offered Rome's financial backing to put your city back in order. We're going to rebuild for you. We got the money. When he came to Laodicea, and he actually came to La Laodicea. When he came to Laodicea, the emperor came to Laodicea and let me rebuild your town. This was the answer of their citizens. Thank you very much, emperor but we are rich. We have acquired great wealth, and we don't need anything. You can keep your money. And Laodicea was the only city in Asia Minor that did not accept any help from the emperor to rebuild their city, and they rebuilt it. Now, with those things in mind, listen to John in Revelation. Uh, I forgot to show you the columns. That's supposed to be banking. Listen to John in Revelation. And, and imagine Jesus saying this, because that's who is. This is what you must write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. I am the one called Amen. I am the faithful and true witness and the source of God's creation. Listen to what I say. And if you're following along with me, I'm now going to skip the next two verses. We'll get back to them later. Verse 17. Jesus is saying this to the Christians in Laodicea. You claim to be rich and successful and to have everything you need, but you don't know how bad off you are. You are pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Buy your gold from me. It has been refined in fire and it, it will make you rich. Buy your white clothes from me. Wear them and you can cover up your shameful nakedness. Buy medicine for your eyes from me so that you will be able to see. I correct and punish everyone I love, so make up your minds to turn away from your sins. Listen, listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice, Open the door. 
I will come in and we'll eat together. Everyone who wins the victory will sit with me on my throne, just as I won the victory and sit with my father on his throne. If you have an ear, listen to what the Spirit has to say to the churches. I I want to point out, Jesus is using all the famous qualities and attractions of Laodicea as illustrations. Okay, he's using them to cause them to pause and give reflection to your Christian walk. Okay, buy your gold from me. Buy your white clothes from me. Buy your medicine for your eyes from me. Okay, can y'all hear that? Now, I hear that, and the only thing that kind of sounds a little wonky is he said white clothes. Because you heard me say earlier that Laodicea is famous for what? Yeah, for black clothes. So I'm studying this going, well, what's up with that? And so I, I can give you a guess. Um, why, would he say, buy your black, why wouldn't he say, buy your black clothes from me? Because that seemed to would fit the pattern there. And the only answer I know to give you is to look at the bigger picture of the book of Revelation. Okay, so as you look at the whole book of Revelation, you can see that Jesus is kind of prescribing to the, to the Laodiceans what you need to do to get back in good graces with me, to get your focus back in the right direction. Okay? And in that, he's going to say, you need to purchase white clothes. You know, and you're going to do that to clothe and get rid of and hide your shame and the shame of your nakedness. And, and, and here's what I mean by that. White garments in the book of Revelation... It's a theme, okay? It's a pattern. It's going to be something you read about. And white clothes in the book of Revelation are very illustrative of an important idea God is trying to get across. So earlier in the letter, um, you know, this is in chapter 3, but earlier in the letter of chapter 3, we're going to read the letter to Sardis, and it's going to say, a few of you in Sardis have not dirtied your clothes with sin. You will walk with me in white clothes, because you're worthy. So you can, you can see how white clothes are used there. In Revelation, in the very next verse, he, and he added that those who overcome will be clothed in white garments. Okay, so you can see this theme about what white means. Later on, we're going to see uh, in Revelation 4, uh, the 24 elders around the throne are clothed in white garments. And at the end of the book, uh, Revelation chapter 20, Uh, When the heavenly army of believers comes with Jesus, they are also clothed in white linen. Okay, they are also clothed in white linen. That's Revelation 20, verse 14. And the bride of Christ is clothed in fine, bright, clean linen. And that linen is described in Revelation 20, verse 8, as the good things God's people have done, or as the New American Standard words it, The righteous acts of the saints. So what is the white clothes? The righteous acts of the saints. Now, it's going to make a little bit more sense when you go back and figure out, he's telling them, you need to get your righteous acts from me. Can can I just ask this? As opposed to getting them from where? How about this? From your city. From what your culture thinks is righteous acts. If the Laodiceans were to buy righteous acts from Jesus, it would be very similar to being prescribed, hey, get your gold from me. Okay, you want pure gold? Get it from me. And the Laodiceans should trade in their own selfish pursuits, um, giving themselves fully to God. And I kind of get that's the impression and that's what he's trying to say. Uh, give yourself to God, but you give yourself to God not in order to gain some kind of positional righteousness. That's a weird way to put it, isn't it? You don't give yourself to God to gain something. You know, if you're dating somebody and they're a member of the church and you're not, you don't become a member of the church so that you can just prove something to that girl and maybe she'll like you and get married with you and then, then you can quit. Okay, that's like a positional righteousness. You're trying to gain something. Um, You're not going to say things like this. Well, 
it's obviously that I'm a spiritual giant because I'm the CEO of a company. It's obvious that I must be an awesome steward because I'm a CEO. And it's obvious that I should be one of the elders of the church. You know why? Because I'm a CEO. That's positional righteousness. That's positional righteousness instead of saying something like this. Because somebody is a good employee and they work as if they're working for the Lord and not for man, oh, that's what matters. Do you see the difference? So again, where, where do our selfish pursuits come from? Y'all ever heard that saying right there? He who dies with the most toys wins. Is that true? Our world thinks it is. When I typed in that phrase, I could find everybody actually supporting that phrase. And they were showing you all the stuff that you could have. And they were taking pictures of their garage and their lake homes to show you all the cool stuff that they had to prove that they're the winners. Okay, the Laodiceans should trade in their own selfish pursuits, giving themselves to God in order to gain a righteousness that only comes through him. So I added something. Can y'all see what that is, right? That is a hearse at a graveyard with a U-Haul trailer hitched up to it. What is wrong with that picture? What's the phrase? Ready? Say it. Yeah, you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. I, I, in my notes, I wrote it like this. You can't take your horse and trailer with you. I meant your hearse and trailer with you. Okay, that was really bad. Jesus is going to look at the values and the pursuits. Okay, let me back up. Jesus looked at the values and the pursuits of the Christians in Laodicea and had something to say about it. Okay, now I'll go back to what I just said. Jesus is going to look at our values and pursuits and make a judgment about it. He's going to do that individually, I believe. He may even be doing it congregationally. He seems to be talking to the church of Laodicea. He says, verse 15, I'm going back to those two verses, I know everything you have done. And you're not cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. But since you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, you make me sick. What's the next picture? What is it? I will spit you out of my mouth. And no, I don't have a picture of that. Sorry. I looked and found a bunch of gross ones and almost, and I went, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause here for a little bit, and I want to try to clear up something rather than muddy the water. Uh, I believe that this passage of Scripture has been used to teach some things that I don't think are correct. Okay, they... I've listened to the teaching and, and I remember buying into it. And then I remember going, yeah, but that's just, I don't know. And then I had some things happen while I was here at Broken Arrow and had some people use these scriptures in the way that I'm telling you about. And I went, that is not right. That's just not right. So I want to help clear up something about how we apply these verses according to what the Christians in Laodicea would have understood when they heard those words. Okay, what they would have understood, and I'm going to be looking at the question of where did Laodicea even get their water? Okay, but let me move on and say this. You might have been taught or understood this passage to teach. There's hot water, there's cold water, and then there's lukewarm water. And you might have been taught that the hot water stands for that person that is super on fire for God. Man, for God, 
if you're hot, if you're hot water, you're doing great as a Christian. And you might have been taught that that cold water is you are frozen against God. You are on the opposite side of that hot Christian. You are a super cold Christian. You're not, I mean, you're just like against God. You're either for him or you're against him. You're either hot or you're crazy cold. And then they turn to lukewarm and they say, lukewarm? It's almost like a lukewarm Christian is somebody that thinks they're a Christian. They come here and they want to look like a Christian and they want to play like a Christian. And it's kind of like they show up and they act one way when they show up at church events. But when they go back to school or they go back to work or they go back to their house, they don't act like it at all. In this line of thought, well, I mean, if you're looking at the quotes there, um, of course, hypocrite is that word if you can't see all of it. Uh, Francis Chan puts it this way, lukewarm people don't really want to be saved from their sin. They just want to be saved from the penalty of their sin. I could say it like this. They don't want to quit sinning. They just don't want to get punished for it. So they want to act nice on Sunday and then go ahead and do whatever they want to do and want to feel good about they're not going to get punished for it because they acted good on Sunday. They showed up, you know, checked their card, punched their button or whatever it's called. And some people are trying to say, using the passage here about you're neither hot nor cold, I wish you were one or the other. They, are tried, they tried to tell me that Jesus is saying, I would rather you be either for me or against me. Then be a hypocrite. If you're going to go, if you're going to be somebody who shows up on Sunday and pretend to love me, quit fooling yourself. I would rather you love me or hate me than say that you love me and act like you don't. I've actually heard people tell me that. I've heard it preached before. So can I point out something? I guess not. <laughs> wow. Uh, you can either truly love God and go to heaven, or you can act like you love God and go to church activities and act like you love him, and then all your other rest of your life you don't, and be eternally lost. Or you can, act, you can never even act like you love God, don't even pretend like you love God, and still be eternally lost. So here's what I see in both in that illustration. Only one of them's making it. If that's the way you're trying to say the hot and cold and the lukewarm is. And, and you're going to have a hard time convincing me that it's better. I had somebody, this is what somebody tried to convince me of, so I'll just tell it out straight. Somebody tried to convince, convince me that they should not come to worship. One of our church members, Scott, I should not come to worship because if I did, I'd be a hypocrite and God would rather me not show up if that's the way it's going to be. And I went, oh, no, I, I'm not going to tell you what I thought. But do you, you understand what he was saying? God says, if my heart's not in it, then I shouldn't even go. I'm going to tell you straight up, you know, my wife doesn't feel that way about me. Because if, if i got to do something at home and my heart's not in it, she's not going, well, you know, God probably wouldn't want you to do that then. Really? Okay. I've actually been tried to be convinced that that's what this is talking about. God would, other, God would rather you be evil toward him. That way everybody knows. Really? Don't you think you'd rather you go ahead and show up so that maybe your hard heart would hear something? Don't you think he'd rather you at least show up and hang out with Christian people so they can rub off their peer pressure on you to be a child of his? No, no, I think God pretty much says if, if I'm going to be evil, he wants me to, I mean, if I don't feel it inside, I just need to run away. I just don't agree with that, and I don't think this passage teaches that. So I am going to tell you this. I think that Jesus is saying, you got some cool hot stuff. Look at Heropolis. You got some cool cold stuff, awesome spring water from Colossae. You guys aren't either, either of those. Okay, you guys are lukewarm. So I ask you about where did, where did Laodicea get their water? They got it basically from a spring straight south of there, um, about five miles, and they put in an aqueduct, 
And this cold water, by the time it got to them, was not cold. So it really didn't do any good to pump in this cold water. It was almost a laughing stock of the area. I, I was even told that they tried to put in an aqueduct from getting hot water from Hierapolis. I, I, haven't, I didn't really find examples of that, so I'm not even sure. But what I do know is the, the cold water that they did pipe in was so mineral, calcium rich that it stunk really bad and was horrible to the taste. So they pumped in water to their city, spent all this money to do that, and they couldn't even use it without really doctoring it up. They had to boil it again. They had to perfume it. They had to make it smell better before they could even belly it. Okay? And so that's the water they're going to be thinking of. And I was going to show you a map like that one where I could show you the pumping station where that water came in, where they started sending it to other places in the city, and it was so corroded. That's it. That's, a, that's not a big, like, anteater pile. That's actually... The, the, the pumping, the water station, uh, the first one that, that came in from the aqueduct and started sending it, and it's so corroded. But they used it anyway, and they ended up having to pay a bunch of people just to walk in water, uh, plus what they could boil and perfume and use. All right, I know that that's kind of the, the bell is up, the, the time is gone, so we're going to say that. Let me read my little closing phrase way down here, and it goes like this. The state of the church in Laodicea was one of self-satisfaction and complacency. Okay, and apparently the Christians uh, had bought in to the, to the city's ideology. Okay, they enjoyed a high degree of comfort, a high degree of prosperity, a high degree of self-confidence and do-it-myself. Uh, factors which I believe led to a horrible conclusion on their part of how they acted out their Christianity, and therefore they misunderstood their condition. Remember what Jesus said, you say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, I don't need a thing, but you don't even realize that you are wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind and you're naked. Um, without going into further, I just say, let's just make sure that individually we take an inventory of where we are and where our priorities come from and how we put that into play. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being rich. You just got to be careful of how you depend on it and what you do with it. I get it. Okay, there's nothing wrong with being in an affluent church. You just got to be careful with what you do with it and how you become self-sufficient in it. Uh, I could say America has to worry about that. I could say our church has to worry about that. I could say individually we have to worry about that. Let's bow in prayer and then we'll be done. Father, thank you uh, for the words of admonition that you've given to the church in Laodicea. Father, we know that even all the churches there may have struggled with, with this very thing, but maybe uh, the church in Laodicea uh, more mightily than the others. Father, if that's uh, our condition, may our eyes be opened. Uh, may we allow Scripture to uh, permeate us so that we see what you expect from us and we're able uh, to allow our hearts to be malleable and, and to be able to be shaped uh, by you. Father, we have this deepest prayer in Christ's name. Amen.